Hi guys and welcome to the third lecture for chapter 7. Today we're going to dive into the topic of soils, what they are, how they are formed, why they are useful, and how they can be degraded. Alright, let's check it out. So let's get into an idea of what soils are, and I want you to pay attention here because there is a lot to unpack. Soils are broadly defined as a complex system of disintegrated rock, organic matter, water, gases, nutrients, and both micro and macro organisms. Now, I want you to take a look at some of the components that we just talked about in soils, and I want you to refer back to chapter four, particularly when we were talking about our biomes lecture. Now, keep in mind that disintegrated rock, organic matter, water, gases, and nutrients, these are all abiotic or non-living components. However, soils also have a lot of biotic components. They have microorganisms, things like bacteria, protists, and fungi, and they have several macroorganism components such as worms, burrowing insects, maybe some different kinds of slugs, and other types of invertebrates. And for this reason, soil is both an abiotic or non-living factor and a biotic factor or living factor because soil has both components. And soils provide the foundation for both our food supply as well as the foundation for every terrestrial ecosystem on the planet. We're going to keep marine environments and marine ecosystems over in their own box for right now. And when we refer to ecosystems, think terrestrial ecosystems because marine processes are completely different and we don't want to get into that for the context of this class. But for terrestrial systems, think about how every, every ecosystem, when you look at the food chain, begins with primary producers. Primary producers get all of their nutrients from soil. So without good, healthy soils, we cannot build a larger food web and we can't, cannot build a highly complex or diverse ecosystems. So without soils, none of these complex terrestrial ecosystems would be possible. So by volume, soil is going to consist of mineral matter, organic matter, and just straight up pore space empty space in between the other two components. 45 to 50 percent of soil is going to be mineral matter. Those are going to be raw inorganic materials, things like rock, sand, uh, metals, maybe some trace elements, some nutrients. These are going to be raw inorganic materials. Then 5% of your soil is going to be organic material. This is going to be organic compounds. Think way back to chapter two, that organic compounds are going to be those complex carbon-based molecules with large branching chain-like structures, normally with a lot of carbon bonded to either nitrogen, oxygen, or hydrogen. And this is going to come from both living and non-living microorganisms, as well as decaying plant and decaying animal material. And then finally, 45 to 50% of soil is just going to be straight up pore space, empty spaces in between the grains of inorganic material and organic material. And note that that pore space can be filled with either air or water, depending on how saturated your soils are with water. And again, what I want you to also note here is that these numbers kind of vary. Notice I said 45 to 50 percent for two of the larger components, and this is because it varies depending on which soils you look, like, look at. If you look down here on the little diagram, you have uh, mineral matter being composed of around 45 percent of a uh, soil by volume and pore space being 50. And then I think your book, depending on which version you have at this moment, will have this flipped. It will have 45 percent pore space and maybe 50 percent mineral or inorganic material. So these ratios are a rough idea. They aren't necessarily set in stone. And what I want you to take away from this is that the majority of soil is inorganic material and pore space with a little bit of organic material and a little bit of living microorganisms thrown in between there. Now I want you to understand here that soil forms slowly. And this is because that soil has to start from scratch in order to go from a very raw base material all the way up to the very complex system that we see it today. And soil starts from something called parent material. This is going to be completely uh, mineral based geologic material that soil is originally composed of. And this comes from raw inorganic material or mineral material such as lava, volcanic ash, rock, and if you're in Florida, dunes such as sand. And the primary component of parent material that starts a soil is going to be bedrock. That is going to be straight up solid rock directly comprising the Earth's crust. No pore space. It is literally just going to be large 
chunks of enormous rock. So the big question is, well, if it starts out as this large rock, how does it get to the super complex structure and system that we know it to be now? And the answer is weathering. Weathering is defined as the physical, chemical, and then biological processes that convert very large rocks gradually into smaller and smaller and smaller particles. And weathering is one of the dominant processes that convert bedrock and all of that raw mineral material into the complex process and complex systems that soil is today. And again, this, this happens over hundreds of thousands of years, so it takes a very long time for all of this to happen. The first is the physical component, and this is where wind and water get in there and break a very large rock down into smaller and smaller pieces. Then we have the chemical component, and this is largely going to be expedited with water. Now, I'm not sure if you've taken chemistry yet, but water is sometimes referred to as the universal solvent, and that is because a lot of materials, mostly salts, metal ions, and a lot of minerals can actually be dissolved in water. So when water makes contact with the rock and gets into the nooks and crannies, it can chemically begin to break down that rock simply by dissolving some of its larger components. Then, finally, we get to our biological processes. Once you have your minerals and your water and a little bit of air, pioneer species, think back to primary succession, can get into bedrock and this somewhat broken down state and begin to grow. Once you have pioneer species and some microorganisms growing in that semi-developed soil, all of a sudden that can invite larger species to get in there and further mix things up. And and through this succession, essentially, you're going to convert partially deconstructed bedrock into a more and more and more complex system. Basically, what happens is that once these organisms begin to get in there, biological deposition, then decomposition as these organisms die, and eventual accumulation of organic matter and nutrients gets in there and makes the soil increasingly complex. And essentially what happens is these pioneer species and then later more developed organisms gradually inject organic compounds through waste products and just decomposition as they die in the soil and contribute all of this organic matter to eventually create the mature system that we know soil as today. And as organic matter builds up and continues to build up as the soil continues to mature, something called hummus begins to form. Hummus is a spongy, fertile material primarily composed of large quantities of organic matter, mainly plant and some decaying animal matter, that is right on top of the soil. And it's really useful because it's a ripe source of organic matter and nutrients, as well as a huge reservoir for moisture, especially for juvenile plants. Now, I'm just going to take a minute to tell you that every single year I ask a question about hummus on your exam, and every year I give a joke answer that hummus is the stuff, the dip that you get at the store, primarily composed of chickpeas. That is a joke answer and it is a little concerning how many students actually select that answer. So please note that hummus is the spongy fertile organic material right on the top of the soil. It is not the garbanzo bean or chickpeas chickpea based dip that you get at the grocery store. Please know what this actually is. And again, what I want to get you guys to keep in mind is that soils, this, all of these processes that we've just talked about, unfold over hundreds of thousands of years. An example is that it can take up to 100 years to even form a single inch of soil. And so technically, while this, while soil is a renewable resource because it does renew itself, it renews itself on such slow timescales that it is a very exhaustible renewable resource and it is essentially a non-renewable resource on human timescales. So just uh, in front of you here is a diagram kind of going over all of the things that we just talked about. You have your first stage where you have raw consolidated bedrock being broken down by physical and chemical processes associated with wind and water. Then once you have some partial mixing of that disintegrated mineral matter and a little bit of water and pore space, all of a sudden you get your second uh, stage here where you have pioneer organisms beginning to get in here and mix things up, inject a little bit of organic matter and more pore space into the soil. And in uh, section three, we begin to have something called horizons form. Soil horizons are something we're literally just about to get into in a second here. And then finally, as this continues to happen and these soil horizons begin to stratify, you finally get your mature soil. And again, if you look at the bottom here, you get a time scale that this happens over thousands and thousands of years.
And so those things I just referred to, soil horizons, are distinct layers of soil that form as a result of different biogeochemical processes, such as biological deposition, that's going to be from your microorganisms and pioneer species, and then later your mature vegetation, processes that are physical, such as weathering, as well as water movement and just basic soil chemistry. And soils can have up to six horizons, each of which we're about to go over in just a second. But what I want you to understand is that these horizons form as soils continue to mature. And to further illustrate and conceptualize this, you can see the diagram over on the right hand side of your screen, or you can take a look at the soil horizons developing in the diagram on the previous slide. But what I want you to understand is that immature soils have relatively few horizons, and as they mature, they gradually gain more and more as these soils begin to stratify. And this brings us to our soil horizons. Now, I'm going to spend a lot of time on this slide, and that is because I need you to know every single one of these soil horizons to get a good grade on your quizzes and your exams. All of these are extremely important and I expect you to know all of them when I test you on them. Now we're going to begin with our highest horizon vertically and then we're gradually going to move deeper and deeper and deeper into the soil. At the very top we have what's called our O horizon and what I want you to think of when, I, when you think of O horizon is this is your organic horizon. This horizon is basically going to be a layer composed of leaf litter, microorganisms, and partially decomposed detritus. This is where your hummus is as, as well as the bulk of your organic matter. Moving farther down, just below the o, o horizon, is something called the A horizon. The A horizon you can think of as your topsoil horizon. This is composed of a mixture of inorganic matter as well as organic matter and a lot of mineral material as well as water. This is where you're going to have the bulk of your microorganisms as well as a few of your invertebrates such as earthworms or different insects getting in there and mixing things up and this is where you're going to have a lot of your nutrients that plants like to have. Next moving from your A horizon downward you get to your E horizon. The E horizon stands for your alluviated horizon meaning downward transport of particles. This horizon is sometimes referred to as the layer of leaching and it is primarily composed of sand grains while the mineral and organic material is leached out and deposited downward. If you Notice on the right hand side of your screen, the A horizon and the E horizon look very different. The A horizon is very dark with a lot of enriched mineral and organic material. Meanwhile, the E horizon is very pale and is very nutrient depleted. All of those nutrients have fallen down. Water has come through, grabbed all of those nutrients and transported them downward. Moving farther down, you get to your B horizon. The B horizon is going to be your zone or layer of accumulation. All of those nutrients that were taken out of your E horizon have now been deposited in your subsoil or zone of accumulation. This is where a lot of your deeper nutrients are going to now reside just because water has moved them downward. Finally, you get your C and your R horizons. Your C horizon is partially decomposed bedrock, so it's going to be large chunks of rock, and your R horizon is just going to be straight parent material. That is going to be just straight up solid rock. Now, again, I want you to know all six of these horizons and what they consist of when I test you for your exams. Now what I want you to keep in mind here is that not all soils have the same layers in the same thicknesses and not all soils have all soil horizons. Some, like the desert for example, might not have an organic horizon or any hummus at all just because there's so little uh, biological activity in a desert that there's just not enough to generate a nice solid O horizon. So soil horizons and the thicknesses of soil horizons vary if you look at ecosystem to ecosystem or more importantly from biome to biome and again what's important for organic life are going to be your mineral components your organic components and the amount of water in that soil and again that will vary depending on what biome or what ecosystem you look at let's look at three different examples from three different biomes that we talked about in chapter four so the first example are going to be grasslands and for a number of reasons grasslands have a very very thick A horizon. And this is for a number of reasons. Grasslands are intermediately productive. They are not so biologically productive that, new, that plants are going to be readily competing for all the available nutrients that, are pot, that they can possibly get their hands on. So they're not too competitive like rainforests, which we'll talk about in a minute. And there is just enough biological activity to where they can generate enough organic matter to actually build up a fairly large A horizon. So you can think of grasslands as kind of in between between 
deserts, which have very low A horizons due to biological inactivity, and tropical rainforests, which have very low A horizons because of too much biological activity. So you can think of them as having a thick A horizon because they are intermediately biologically productive. In addition, grasslands do a really great job of trapping down soil with their thick root rhizomes, and so they prevent a lot of that material from actually being alluviated into the B horizon. So if you look at grasslands, you see a very thick A horizon and then a thick B horizon, but you don't really see an E horizon. And this is partially because of the root rhizome structure of the plants that live in grasslands. Moving to rainforests, they have a very thin A horizon. And this is because there's so much nutrient cycling and the rainforests are so biologically productive that all of the nutrients and all of the organic matter in a soil of a tropical rainforest is instantly sucked up the moment it is made available. And that again is because there are so many plants growing so quickly in a rainforest that all of the available nutrients are just just immediately taken up. Then moving to deserts, deserts have a very thin A horizon, but for the completely opposite reason. Again, because there's such low biological activity, there is simply not enough organic matter generated for deserts to actually have an A horizon. So depending on where you add, different biomes have different soil structures and different soil horizon structures. So now that we know what soil is, why it is important, particularly within the context of agriculture as well as environmental systems, and now that we have an idea of how long it actually takes for soil to be generated, starting from barren rock all the way up to the complex systems that we know today, we're going to spend some time looking at ways that soil can be degraded. There are three primary causes of soil degradation. The first is over-irrigation, the second is over-grazing, and the third is over-fertilization. And each one of these forms of soil degradation has specific problems directly associated with it, and each one of these forms of soil degradation has solutions. There are ways to remedy these problems. On the exam, I will expect you to know all three forms of soil degradation, all of the problems associated with them, and ways to remedy each one of these problems. So I want you to really pay attention to the next few slides in this lecture. All right, so let's dive into soil degradation forms and begin with soil over irrigation. So over irrigation is simply applying too much water to our soils. Recall back to industrial agriculture and intensification. And one of the ways that we bolster crop yields through intensification is to increase the inputs into that farm. One of those inputs or one of those resources is water. And it follows that if we normally put more water into a farmland, we can actually increase our yields. Plants will grow faster and yield food in higher quantities and more quickly. However, there is too much of a good thing. And if we over irrigate, or over apply water to the soils in our farms, we can actually degrade the soil in a number of different ways. The first is salinization, the second is water logging, and then finally we can degrade it through leaching. Salinization is basically the buildup of salts in a soil, and it comes from over irrigating our cropland or our soils with a very specific type of water. Water that is rich in salts and different types of ions. Sometimes, depending on where you get water from, it has absorbed a bunch of different uh, types of elements, minerals, molecules, etc. And all of those salts will get deposited into the soil as we continue to irrigate. If we irrigate with this type of water over and over and over again, the actual water either evaporates or gets used up by the plant. And what remains are the salts. And the more we continue to irrigate with this type of salty mineral dense water, the more those minerals and the faster those minerals will build up in the soil. Eventually the soil becomes completely saturated with these different minerals and salts and it actually reaches a point where it becomes toxic and plants can no longer live in it. An example of salinization is going to be the image over here on the top right hand side of your screen. You can see dense aggregations of minerals and salt and you can see that there are actually no plants living there because the soil has become too toxic and can no longer support life. Water logging is probably the easiest to understand conceptually when we talk about problems associated with over irrigation. Water Water logging is essentially flooding a farm and the soils in a farm and raising the water table up until the point where the farm is actually flooded. You can see that in the central image over on the right hand side of your screen. Now what happens here is that plants like any other organism on the planet actually respirate. What I mean here is that after they're done photosynthesizing where they have taken the sun's light and carbon dioxide and then used that to build sugars, they then inhale oxygen 
th from their roots, from their stems, and from their leaves, break down some of those sugars, and use that energy to grow and execute some of their metabolic processes. However, when we flood the soils, those pore spaces that once held air are now completely covered in water. What happens is we are actually drowning their roots. When that happens, it kills the plant. And in addition, whenever we make a soil too wet, it makes it really easy for things like fungus, mold, bacteria, and all of these things we really don't want on our farm to actually grow really quickly. And so not only are the plants dying from lack of air to their soils, they also are dying through disease and sicknesses associated with waterborne illnesses. So waterlogging is also a really quick way to actually kill off all of the plants in your soils. The final problem associated with over irrigation is accelerated leaching. Now recall that soils are actually le leached very commonly and it is part of soil maturity. We actually have that E horizon, the layer of leaching that is very common in very mature soils because water has transported nutrients from the A layer down to the B layer and we get this layer that doesn't actually have any nutrients. So that is natural. However, there is again too much of a good thing when we over irrigate and when we add water far more frequently than a soil would actually see in that environment, we can actually accelerate this process of leaching. As we add water over and over again at a frequency that is far faster than what that soil is naturally uh, used to, what happens is we accelerate the movement of nutrients from the A layer down to the B layer. And so what, when we accelerate leaching, we actually remove nutrients from an area where plants can actually get them, the A layer or the topsoil layer, and deposit them down in the B layer where many crop plants can't actually reach them. So we deplete the nutrients of the soil simply from adding water over and over again at a frequency that is too fast. And again, this just removes soil nutrients from the A layer to the B layer, which is just too deep for plants to reach them, and we get decreased yields as a result. Now, overgrazing is a form of soil degradation that occurs when you have too many large grazing animals, normally cattle, on your rangeland. When you have too many cattle on your rangeland, they are going to eat grass and vegetation at a rate that is faster than the grass can naturally replenish itself. When you eat too much of that grass faster than it can replenish itself, you now leave the soil exposed. You are eating up all of the vegetation. There is no longer a cover for that soil, which would protect it ordinarily from wind and water. When the soil is exposed to wind and water, that can sweep the nutrient-dense topsoil, the A layer, away and you have large amounts of soil erosion. When you lose those nutrient dense layers in the soil, new plants have a harder time growing in that same area. And so you get this vicious cycle or this positive feedback loop. As this positive feedback loop gets worse and worse, more of the surface area of the rangeland gets degraded and eventually you have a rangeland with soil that is so depleted that no more of those natural plants can actually grow there. In addition, whenever you begin to deplete the soil and you lose those native plants, that opens up the door for any invasive species which might be in the area. So when the soil was healthy and the ecosystem was healthy and had all those native grasses occupying all of, that, uh, all of the space on that rangeland, we were okay and we didn't necessarily have to worry so much about invasive species. However, once those plants are gone, that opens the door for resource exploitation by new invasive species which might be able to capitalize on that opportunity. When that happens, not only is it going to be harder to regrow your native plants because the soils are worse, it also is going to be harder because that area is now occupied by an invasive plant which can survive in those soil depleted conditions. So overgrazing can be a really big problem. And the final way that we can degrade our soils is through over-fertilization. And over-fertilization is simply applying too much fertilizer to our soils. Remember that, again, with the intensification of agriculture, what we are doing is increasing the inputs into our farms to increase our yields. How we can do that is we can bolster the amount of nutrients in a soil by increasing the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus in that soil. Those are the primary nutrients that plants need to accelerate their growth. However, 
what some farmers don't actually realize is that there is a very finite amount of nitrogen and phosphorus that a soil can actually contain. When you apply fertilizer over that limit, it just sits on top of the soil. When that happens, water and wind can sweep it away. Now, this can be a huge problem because this is how we pollute our waterways and lead to that eutrophication that we talked about way back in chapter two. What happens is that water flows across the soil, picks up all of that nitrogen phosphorus that was not absorbed into the soil, and it runs into rivers where it can lead to eutrophication in lakes or large water bodies like the Chesapeake Bay. Now, that is not the only way that over fertilization can be a really big problem, and I want you to pay attention to the other two as well as eutrophication because eutrophication was already covered. The other two are also really important. When we over apply fertilizer to a given soil, the other ways that we can degrade areas around soil is through leaching into the groundwater. When water trickles through the soils that have too much nitrogen, in particular, they can absorb that nitrogen, keep it in suspension, and it can actually lead to the groundwater. When we start drinking too much nitrate in the groundwater, it can lead to a whole host of health problems. So that is an additional way that adding too much fertilizer can really mess things up. Finally, if you leave nitrogen and phosphorus sitting on top of that soil, what happens is that sunlight can react the nitrogen and phosphorus with ambient air and actually volatize it, meaning that the nitrogen and phosphorus actually gets put into the air as a pollutant where it can cause air pollution. So remember, when we apply too much fertilizer, we can one, accelerate eutrophication in nearby water bodies, two, pollute our groundwater through excess nitrate, or three, create air pollution through the chemical reactions of sunlight with nitrogen and ambient air. I need you to remember all three of those. Now we touched on the process of erosion before, but here we're going to go over it in a little bit of detail. And this is because erosion is a major contributor to the decline of soil ecosystems. And when we talk about erosion specifically, we're going to refer to the transfer of material from one place or another via either wind or water. And again, this is something that we've touched on through multiple slides in this lecture and in others. Now again, erosion is problematic because it removes soil much faster than it can form. Erosion can remove soil on the order of days to weeks, where soil takes hundreds of years to hundreds of thousands of years to form depending on the environmental conditions at play. And in addition, erosion tends to most greatly affect the higher layers of soil, that O and that A layer of soil, that are also the most nutrient dense. So not only are we impacting our soils faster than they can heal themselves, but we're also taking the layers that are most important for plant growth. And land can be made more susceptible to erosion by over cultivating our fields, so plowing our fields way too much, over grazing in ways that we already talked about in the overgrazing slide, and clear cutting forests, which also hold down soil and prevent it from being eroded away. So, all three of these methods can accelerate erosion and cause increased loss of our soil, which leads to further degradation. And all of these forms of soil degradation, as well as erosion, which keep in mind is just a separate process that leads to air degradation, contribute to something called desertification. Desertification, or transitioning to a desert, occurs when 10% or more of the productivity of a land or a soil is lost. And this is caused by a variety of the things that we've already talked about, all of these processes that degrade our soils. Things such as erosion, soil compaction, deforestation, overgrazing, drought, salinization, and all of these in particular are accelerated by climate change, usually because areas that are very susceptible to becoming a desert are made more susceptible by climate change, changing up some of the precipitation and the rainfall patterns. So what that means is that land that is most vulnerable to desertification or productivity loss are going to be areas in arid or semi-arid conditions. And indeed, this is where we are seeing the majority of our soil Soil degradation on the planet. Now, this was a little bit depressing toward the end here, but this kind of tees everything off for the sustainable agriculture lecture, which is the final lecture of this chapter. I hope you guys got a lot out of this soil lecture, and I'll see you guys for the final lecture in chapter seven, which again goes over sustainable agriculture and ways to remedy all of the problems that we just talked about. I'll see you guys then.